In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's Gospel text has in it, without doubt, a beloved and familiar image, the image of the Good Shepherd and the Lost Sheep. The image is stained into many a church's window, carved into a great many altars, and painted and printed on wall hangings and in books throughout Christendom. It is a treasured and universal Christian image, and rightly so. To be lost and then found, to trust that the Lord's love and concern are indeed unconditional and without limit, to believe that the Lord would search us out, even recklessly, well, this surely is an image, an image of the gospel, an image of our salvation. But inasmuch as we might treasure this image of the gospel, have we thought through what this image fully depicts? We are indeed drawn to it, to be sure, to be the sheep that the shepherd goes after, to be the one for whom the heavens come undone in joy. What could be better? It is certainly a tender picture. It is who we are in the gospel. We are the ones who have been lost and then found. And who wouldn't want it that way? But inasmuch as we treasure this image and find ourselves in it, I wonder if perhaps we tend to see it only in part and not fully. We would like to think that we were lost at one point and were then found. That this was something, this business of being lost and found, which happened in the past, but isn't necessarily happening anymore. That this isn't happening now, that it was all somewhat historical. As if sheep only but wander once. And yes, in one sense, we were lost and found in our past. All of us were found in our baptisms, to be sure. The heavens did break forth in joy that the Good Shepherd had claimed yet another sheep for his flock when he tagged us as his own in holy baptism. But we are foolish then to think that because we were baptized, we won't wander away again. We are foolish to think that we have only been found once, that we were only lost in the past and do not lose our way now. Because you see, the baptized life is a life of being found over and over again. And so it is then not without reason that our Lord chose sheep to illustrate this point today. Sheep are fickle. They need protecting. They wander endlessly, and they rarely, if at all, learn from their mistakes, nor are they likely to be aware of their wandering. And just because they are found once does not imply that they will never scoot off again and find themselves in all sorts of mischief and trouble and danger as they pursue, with their heads down, something as seemingly innocent as a little bit more grass in a greener pasture somewhere else. Sheep need finding over and over again because they wander, and so do you and I. We are prone to wander, wandering into pastures which often appear greener from afar. Everything is always appealing from afar, isn't it? There's much more of interest to be found in those pastures, or so we should like to think. And so we begin to lose ourselves in thinking about those greener pastures and what might be in them. We dwell on how we could have much more somewhere else. How others have better families, better lives, better jobs. Just look at them. How content they appear, plump and happy. Why can't we have what they have? And so we begin to make our way for their greener pastures. And as we do so, we ignore what God has given to us in our own pastures. We ignore his warning voice, and instead make our own way with our heads down and set out on forging our own path by ourselves. And as we wander off, or simply just imagine wandering off, we begin to lose sight of what it is that is truly before us. As we wander and gaze from afar, we don't notice the ruts in those other pastures, the sinkholes, the grooves, the briar patches, the dead spots, the rocks, the canyons until perhaps it's too late and we are entangled in a mess. And perhaps we don't even notice that this pasture of interest isn't any better than any other pasture. And all of this is because we are too preoccupied with what we think we need, how we do not have it, and how we will get it somewhere else to notice much of anything else beside ourselves, let alone the trouble that waits for us when we make our own path, a path away from and not with and to the Lord. And so nevertheless, we make our own way. We lose our way in this world, and so also do we lose our way with the Lord. We become bored with the Lord, and we find something else to occupy our time. We do not come to the Lord's house as often as we should, because we tire of the same old, same old. We tire of our prayers and our devotions, because they are not as exhilarating as we think they should be. We think they're tedious, and we probably actually make them out to be. 
we tire of our vocations because they aren't thrilling. They don't have any payoff, or so it would seem. And perhaps even if and when we do come to the Lord's house, and when we do attend to our vocations, it is sluggishly done and without much joy. We simply aren't happy with our homes, this church, and our lives. And so not unlike sheep, we go off searching elsewhere for whatever it is we think we are looking for. But what is it that we think we are going to find elsewhere? We aren't going to find true and lasting freedom and salvation. We aren't going to find true and lasting joy and contentment. We aren't going to find true and lasting life in any other pasture besides the Lord and the one that he has put us in. And as we disobey the Lord and do our own thing, we aren't likely going to be aware of what all it is that we are doing because we are so terribly caught up in ourselves. Many people truly wish to be closer to the Lord, but they won't recognize that they are so far from Him because they've unknowingly refused to give thanks for where He actually is in their lives, in their families, in their livelihoods, in their homes, in this house of worship, here at this altar, in this pulpit, in this font, which is for them. And so let us not fool ourselves into thinking that it is simply others who have this problem, this pasture envy. We have it and they have it. They and we forget what we have. They and we wander. They and we become lost. Now this is all certainly frightening as we reflect that perhaps we even are not aware of our own drifting off. An observant theologian once remarked that if you examined a hundred people who had lost their faith in Christianity, I wonder how many of them actually would turn out to be reasoned out of it by honest argument. Do not instead most people simply drift away? And so here we are, having to be found over and over again when we drift into pastures of our own imagining. This is what this text is all about, about wandering and drifting off, to be sure, but more so it is about being found and not left lost. It is indeed about Christ rescuing us over and over again. Because you see, sheep are not clever creatures. They are not likely to know that they have drifted off from the fold. And a coin certainly is not aware that it is lost. But that is the point. That is what the baptized life in the Christian flock is. It's about being rescued even when you are not aware of your need for it. It's about having the shepherd's hook grip you by the neck just before you go too far off in your wandering. It's about loss and return. It's about your repentance and your salvation, your baptized life, your return to the flock because the Good Shepherd will come after you. It's about you being found, and more than once. I said to you earlier that often when we think of the image of the Good Shepherd finding the lost sheep, we only think about it in part, not fully. That we assume that we have been lost and found only once at some point in our past. I think this is in part how we also understand our baptisms, that it was something that happened in the past, but perhaps without an ongoing reality, that once we were lost to sin, but now we've been found to everlasting life. But that simply isn't how it is. Our baptisms do have daily realities. The daily life of baptism is lived out in repentance, in confession and in absolution. The daily life of a baptized Christian indicates that the old Adam in us should, by daily contrition and repentance, be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever, as our catechism has it. And so the life of repentance is where Christ is finding us again and again when we get lost. Now you might wonder what the point of baptism is then if you and I are going to keep drifting away and perhaps wander away. Well, think of the image today. The sheep are already in the flock. You and I are already in the flock. We are baptized into Christ's flock. But just because you and I are in the flock, the church, just because you and I are baptized, does not mean that you and I will always stay put. Just because sheep are in a flock and that they're taken care of does not imply that they will always stay put. This then is why sheep have a shepherd. And this then is why we have a shepherd. We do need someone to come after us. Someone to pull us out of the ruts, someone to disentangle us from snares, someone to hook our necks and jostle us into reality, jostle us into repentance. And so this then is what the baptized life as a sheep of the Good Shepherd looks like. This life is where we will wander off into different pastures at times. 
but where Jesus will, without fail, faithfully lead us back to the flock that we were born into. This is the life where he leads us to this altar, before which we confess our sins, and at which the heavens and all the angels come undone in joy for our having repented, for having returned to the flock. Yes, it may be uncomfortable and awkward when the Lord will jostle us, pull us out of the holes and ruts, take his shepherd's staff, and yank us by the neck before we go too far. But that is that, and so what of it? What is more important is that he will heave you onto his shoulders and take you home. He will get you out of the predicament. And so here you are. You are being taken home, brought back to the flock each and every Sunday. Every Sunday is indeed an unfolding of our very own baptisms, which happened some years ago. We begin in that very same name which we made our start with, that name which found us when we were lost, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We then confess that we have wandered away many, many times, that we have not heeded the voice of our shepherd, but instead followed another voice. And then after that confession, the great shepherd rescues us with the absolution pronounced by his under-shepherd, your pastor, right here at this font. And then we hear again the voice of the good shepherd in his holy words, his gospel. And finally, the angels rejoice and sing with us, but once more, as we take that pledge and security of forgiveness, that very body and blood of the good shepherd who is truly carrying us home on his shoulders. So rejoice, give thanks, and sing, for not only is this a beautiful image of the gospel, it's truly your image. It's the image of your salvation. It's the image of the great shepherd of souls finding you. You are in that image. It's the image of your return home. So yes, stain this image into windows and carve it onto altars. Rejoice and celebrate with the angels and the shepherd. You have indeed been found. Amen. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of